Well, it's an interesting title. Uh, a little bit different for the first Sunday in Advent, but I'm going to draw us into a portion of Scripture that is so critical to the Advent season. I've entitled my message today, No Believer is Debt Free. And now I hear people talking about the joy and the kind of the relief of stress that comes when they pay off their mortgage, when they pay off their last car payment. Uh, I remember the day when our house was paid for and the joy that fills your heart to have that off your back. And you can read a lot of books today about moving towards a debt-free lifestyle. Well, if we were simply talking about dollars and cents, I would say go for it. Being debt-free in terms of your financial debt is a worthwhile objective. But we're going to be talking about something a little bit different this morning. If you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 8. Romans 13, verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. I love that verse. It really draws home to me the importance of love for the Christ follower. And as we begin this Advent season, there's no better place to begin than with the idea of Christian love. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. You will never be debt free as a Christian. We will always bear the debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Let's pray. Our Father, it's a privilege to open the Word this morning, and as we do so, we pray that your Spirit will guide us into the truth that that truth will be applied to our daily life, and that we will grow toward maturity in Jesus. Our desire is to live a life fully devoted to Jesus Christ, and we need your help. For alone we can do nothing, but in Christ, by your Spirit, and through your Word, we can grow and mature and honor and glorify you. So, Father, bless your word this morning as we open our lives to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So the challenge today is to recognize that you are supposed to carry a debt. And that debt, until the day you die, is a debt of loving one another. 
Now, there are a lot of one another's in the Bible. In fact, that's a good personal devotion if you're looking for some creative study during the Advent season. Check out the one another statements in the Bible. But when it comes to love, we often use the concept of one another in relationship to us. Right? Remember in John chapter 13, verse 33 through 35, where he says, they will know you belong to Jesus Christ because of your love for one another. So a person will know that I'm a Christ follower by how I love you, a fellow Christ follower. So when we think about loving one another, we're usually thinking about the church family. Well, that's important. John was absolutely correct. I mean, how in the world can I love the stranger if I can't love a friend? How in the world can I love a Samaritan, a one who is different from me, a different culture, an antagonistic person in my life, if I can't love the people who love me? So John was right. To love one another means to love other disciples of Jesus. But we cannot afford to stop there. And I'm afraid the American church has loved gathering with themselves. But we don't know how to do it well in drawing in the stranger. And that's what he means in chapter 13 of Romans. When he says love one another, you have to understand the context of these verses. If you go back in chapter 12, he's talking about spiritual gifts. And one of those gifts in verse 13 is to practice hospitality. Hospitality. What does that mean in the Bible? Uh, I know what it means for us Baptists. It means potluck dinners. Okay? But that's not the meaning in the Bible. The word hospitality in the Bible means I am reaching out to assist and help a stranger. And, and the best image of that was when Joseph and Mary are traveling to Bethlehem. They can't make it in a single day. So they have to knock on somebody's door and ask for lodging. They don't have reward points at Holiday Inn Express. They're dependent on you. But they don't know you. Maybe you're busy. Maybe you've got a big family. Maybe you just lost a loved one. Maybe life is really hard for you. Maybe you don't have enough food for your own family. And now you're knocking at the door. And they open the door. And they find you a place to lay your head. And put some food on the table. That is hospitality. And so the context of loving one another in chapter 13 has to do with what is going on in chapter 12. And then you look at chapter 12, verse 14, and it says, Bless those who persecute you. <laughs> He's not talking about us in the church, although uh, one could argue that sometimes the American church does a lot of persecuting its own. <laughs> unfortunately. But he's talking about the enemy out there. Those who want to do you harm. Those who do not accept the truth of God's word. Love them. Bless them. And then it comes to the first part of chapter 13 and he says submit to the governing Authorities. In 
In the past number of years, I have never seen such a lack of love in the American Christian community. You don't have to agree with the political opponent. You don't even have to like them. You don't have to vote for them. But you have a debt to love them. Are you with me? Because I am afraid, as I look at all of the put-downs, all of the name-calling, all of the teasing, all of the mocking of those who don't think like us and don't believe like us, it is not fulfilling Romans 13. We need to love one another, but we need to love those folk with the same kind of love. So that context of hospitality to a stranger and those who persecute us and the governing authorities over us must be woven into what we're studying here in verse 8 and following. Here he expands the concept of who we love beyond the disciples to what he refers to as our fellow man. That's not just Christians. That's not just Democrats or Republicans. That's not just the person who literally lives next door. That's not just the person who's a member of my family. That's everyone. And we don't use this in a gender-specific way. Fellow man is a reference to all people. That we don't limit our love for one another. In fact, there are no boundaries for such love. And then he goes on to use the word neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, it, if you're like me and like a lot of people, when we say that, we need to define what we mean by neighbor. It begs the question, who is my neighbor? Because I grew up thinking that my neighborhood consisted of 2nd Street. I can just name all the families. The Chubbs, the Porters, the Sincox, the Johnsons. They were my neighbors. Jesus takes that and blows it out of the water. And I want you to turn with me to the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? It's found in Luke chapter 10. And I'm going to read a section, so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 29. There was a man who was an expert in the Mosaic law. He was an expert in the scriptures that the Jewish people had access to. And he asked the question in verse 29 to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus told this parable. It's one that you've heard about. But do you know the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, 
came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, and he took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and you do likewise. It's an interesting parable for many reasons, but one of the reasons it's interesting is the person that Jesus was setting up as an example of a good neighbor was a Samaritan. I wonder if he couldn't find any among the Jewish followers of Jesus. I wonder if he came into the modern church in America today if he would find better examples of love out in our neighborhood than he would find in our churches. You see, this is important stuff. We need to be the examples to the culture, and yet so often the culture shows us up. The Samaritan, do like he did. He was the good neighbor. So the question, who is my neighbor, has this response. Every person I encounter is my neighbor. The Samaritan didn't stop and say, well, are you a Jew? He didn't stop and look to see if he looked like him. He, he, he didn't stop to see if he was a good person or a bad person or met his political litmus test. He looked at him as a person in need and loved him. And I tell you today, that's how Jesus looks at me. He's moved with compassion as he looks at you and me. It is love without boundaries. It is love without labels. It is love without skin tone. It is love without political litmus. It is love, pure love. And I believe that if the modern church is going to start to turn around and be effective and healthy in ministry, we must embrace biblical love. And we must model it for others because love draws people in, doesn't it? We spent Thanksgiving with our family this year all together at my son's home and do you know that on December 8th he is uh, going to be finalizing the adoption of these two little three-year-old foster kids and to walk into the house and to see the little ones come up and embrace you and that little boy will hug and he will squeeze and he will hold his cheek against you and you feel his love and it draws you in, and there's nothing I like better than that. That's the way God's love works in your life as well. He draws you in, He squeezes you tight, He holds you, and He doesn't run through the litmus test first to see if He's going to draw you in. He just sees you as a person in need of compassion. I see the crowd as sheep without a shepherd. They need me. They need me. Those little kids need Papa. 
That's all I know. They just need me. Do they always have to behave? They don't. They always have to do what you tell them to do? They don't. Because they're a little bit like me. They have a free will. And they don't always get it right. But oh, how they need help in their life. You need Jesus. That person lying on the side of the road, that person who had been robbed and stripped of his clothing and all of his dignity gone. The priest and the Levite did him no good. The religious establishment did him no value. It was the Samaritan that showed the kind of love that Jesus calls the church to show. Yeah, that is profound love. Let's read in Romans 13, the second part of the text that I read earlier. Starting in verse 11, I want you to love this way, understanding that the present time is upon us. The hour has come to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is drawing now, nearer now, than when we first believed. Love one another. This is an urgent command of God. Love not just your fellow disciples, but your fellow man. Love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Anyone that you encounter. A good person, a bad person, a person like you, a person different from you, a person who will love you back and say thank you, and a person who will persecute you, a person who will make loving them easy, and a person who will fight you all the way. Love as the Samaritan loved the man robbed and stripped of his clothing. It's urgent. The day of our salvation is drawing near. In other words, Christ is coming back. The window of opportunity for the church to get it right is not tomorrow, not next year, but now. Pastor Drew and Mary come into this position at really a, a juncture in all of church history that is so critical. I'm so thankful for a young couple who loves the Lord and wants to share that love with others and wants to lead a church towards loving the neighborhood with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's urgent. It's urgent. Let us behave decently as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness. Not in sexual immorality and debauchery. Not in dissension and jealousy. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Or earlier in the text, he talked about putting on the armor of light. Because Jesus is coming again, because the window of opportunity is clothing, closing, we must love one another and not do that. And we can't do that by engaging in the desires of the flesh. So what is God calling us to do today? He's calling us to recognize we have a debt to pay. Jesus paid a debt for me. It's a debt I can never repay. It's a debt that would have cost me more than I could bear. And therefore, I could not do it. But he bore that debt. He gave his life for me. And now he calls me to carry a debt of love. My friends, that's not the ultimate. That's the baseline. 
That's the minimum. That's where we must begin. Because if I cannot love anyone I meet, I cannot be used of God to fulfill the great mission of making disciples. Our neighborhood is ready to be reached, and that comes by loving them as we love ourselves. Oh, how I love you. You know, it's easy to stay where you love people. It's easy to stay where people love you. What's hard is to step outside my comfort zone and to love the unloving. You have loved us well. You know how to love. Not every Christian does. Gail and I feel your love. And we are so blessed by that. I want all these people to know what I know about Troy Road Baptist Church. Because if you love one another the way this is talking, you will have no trouble filling these pews. Because there's a lot of Kylers out in the world that just want to snuggle up. They've been abandoned. They've been hurt. They've been picked on. They've been marginalized. And they just want a papa who will hug them tight. And friends, as you love people that way, they'll come to Jesus. One after another, they'll come to Jesus. And you won't know what to do with this building because you won't be able to house all your neighbors. My closing charge to our church is to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. God bless you. Let's pray. Father God,